want to talk to you today about uh, something very important. You know, the most important thing in the world is salvation. I don't know where you categorize things in your life, but where there's no salvation, there will be no hope. So my sermon title is titled A Different Jesus, Another Gospel. Because there's a lot of people in the world today who are confused about what salvation is. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to pay the price to get there. So the Lord really laid this on my heart this week. So let's read from 2 Timothy. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Timothy 3. And let's, uh, let's look at the word. It's a good one to underline, actually. One, verses 1 through 7. 2 Timothy 3, you there? Here's what it says. But know this. And in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves. I think we see that, don't we? The me, society, all about me. Lovers of money, certainly see that. Boasters, watched any TV lately? Uh, reality TV. Um, proud, we know that God hates pride. Blasphemers, see that all the time if you turn on your television, even looking at a magazine or reading a book. Disobedient to parents, young people listen up. Disobedient to parents, unthankful. Just had Thanksgiving, did you find any unthankfulness around the table or in the house with the folks you were with? Unholy, easy to spot. Unloving, unforgiving, Slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, means arrogant, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Boy, do we see that today. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. As I said, the most important thing in the world is salvation, because without it, you're not going to heaven. And I, I have to back that up by saying, but without repentance, there is no salvation. See, that's not preached much today. Salvation is preached. Heaven is preached. Good psychology is preached. Doing good is preached. What about repentance? You know, we can't live by the world's standards and expect God to be pleased with us. And only through repentance can we hope to attain right standing with God. The Father gives eternal life to those who are in right standing through the power of the cross, the blood of Jesus, that has taken away the sin. If you stood at the gate of heaven and they ask you, why should I let you into heaven? And you'd say, I did a lot of good. I never stole. You could go through all the law. I kept all the law. I did all the right things. I loved people. I loved my family. I provided well for them. And at every answer along the way, the buzzer would sound, uh, wrong answer. Only one right answer. I should get into heaven because my sins have been washed away in the blood of Jesus that was shed at a place called Calvary. That's why I should get into heaven. The only right answer. We've got to speak up in our world today with both the love of Jesus and with the authority he gave us. Christians are cowards these days. Too many of us are afraid to speak it out. We're afraid because we might be wrong politically or uh, in our society in some way. It's time to stand up for Christ and speak out what we believe. It's time to stop tickling people's ears, even in our churches, and lead the church and people into repentance. Jesus said he's coming back for a church that's spotless and blameless, without wrinkle. That means purified and perfect. And if I ask in this room how many are perfect, none of you would raise your hand uh, because you, you're afraid everybody would laugh at you. But we are made perfect because of Jesus and his perfection. So in that sense, yes, we're perfect. But we can't look at our neighbor and start judging him and even if we feel like we are perfect. We need to look at our own personal relationship with God and allow the Holy Spirit to judge us. 
Let's stop judging someone else. Let's get right with God in our own heart. You see, God wants to speak to us personally. He wants to have a relationship with you that is a communicative relationship. We're 14 years into a new millennium here, and we're coming close to the 15th year. Are we in revival yet? I mean, uh, some of the questions facing us, are we experiencing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God in our nation, in our world? Is this the harvest of souls? Are we into it that Joel foretold about revival when he said, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh? How do we compare here at FWC compared with the book of Acts church? Are we doing what we should be doing? Is our world uh, here in Branson seeing uh, Jesus through the way we love each other as people of God? I had some great comments this morning from people saying, uh, you know, this is a really loving church. We really, this is a friendly church. This is a church that seems to care about people. And it is, and thank God for it. And I told those folks, I said, well, uh, we've taught it from the beginning. Carol would say to me when we would travel for 20 years in various churches, we go two, three churches a week. And Carol would say, you know, uh, the people there in that church are a reflection of the leadership. The, the, the folks that we saw, the leadership that was uh, somewhere in an ivory tower, the people would just kind of come and go. And some would be nice to you. But for most of the time, uh, it had to be, it had to be uh, developed. The love of people to people has to be developed. And my statement's still true. If the shepherd doesn't smell a little bit like the sheep, he's not much of a shepherd. We got to be in the field together. We got to be working together. And they also said, we noticed that there's no hierarchy here. Everybody's the same. I said, yes, that's true. We don't lift some people up and think some people are lower. You're a child of God. I'm a child of God. We're all sinners saved by the grace of God through the power of the blood of Jesus. Why is there any difference? Why should there be? Money, no money, it doesn't matter. Uh, clothes, bad clothes, good clothes, it doesn't matter. We want to help people. We want to love people. And that's the thing that's important to me. That's the thing that's important to all of us. We forsaken godliness. Have we, have we forsaken integrity for uh, what seems like... Uh, getting along with everybody. You know, we got churches full of people today. But many of those churches are without the presence of God and without the power of God. I felt miraculous presence of God here earlier in this service. And I, and I know he's here now. He's here as we feed on his word. I can tell you the, this, the revival that Joel prophesied will not come through a church that embraces the world's attitude and loves the world. The prophecy of Joel will come true in a church that has given itself over to the Holy Spirit. I've told people many times, we just want to get out of the way and let God do what he does. That's my heart. That's what we got to do. Look, the revival is never going to come through a lukewarm idol worshiping church. I'm talking about the idols of the world. It won't come as long as we compromise integrity for success and, and numbers for and, and money for the things that we feel like God is doing and you know, it's what God wants us to be. We've reduced the message of the cross to a cheap, quick solution to life problems. We, we give out our little uh, philosophy and we think people are helped because they feel better when they leave. And we've sometimes bypassed repentance just to get a convert. You know, we can make quick converts if we sell the gospel just right. You ever bought a car that once you bought it, you went, why did I buy this car? Because a guy knew how to sell you a car. There's a story about a old fellow who had a general store out in the country. And a salesman who sell food walked in. And all the shelves were filled with salt. There's nothing in there but salt. And the guy says, well, I was going to try to sell you some other things, but it looks like you just sell salt said, you must sell a lot of salt. He said, we don't hardly sell any salt, but that guy who sells me salt, he can sell salt. <laughs> and there are a lot of people who can really convince you that you're okay. Just say these words, sign here, and you're set for eternity, and you don't have to do anything else. Wow. Are they sons of God, those converts? Mm, I'm not sure. It's not just how many converts. It's what kind of converts we're making. It's what we're, what we're showing them, what we're teaching them, how we're discipling them. Jesus said, go into all the world and teach them what I have taught you. 
make disciples of them, baptize them, get them to where they know who I am, but do something else, follow up. Are those converts that we're making, are they forsaking all to follow Jesus? Or have they bought a lie, the, the lie that says, you can serve the world and serve Jesus at the same time? No, you can't. Bible's clear in Matthew 24. Watch out, no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I'm the Christ. They'll deceive many. And in 2 Peter um, chapter 2, verse 1, it said, but there were also false prophets among the people, just as there'll be false teachers among you. They'll secretly induce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them, who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their ways, their shameful ways, and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. Let's read Jude 1, 4. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul warned the church at Corinth over and over again because they were a church that liked the world. They were a church that enjoyed the world and Laodicea and some others. First Corinthians 11, Paul says, but I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent. You happily put up with whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus, a different Jesus, really? than the one we preach or a different kind of spirit than the one you received or a different kind of gospel than the one you believed. So what is another gospel? Well, what is a different Jesus? You know, the, the phrase used there in the Greek, another gospel means to twist or pervert something. It means to take just enough of the real thing and, and put the false with it. So we have all kinds of denominations and philosophies and religious groups who put just enough Jesus in and then they attach their own doctrine behind that that doesn't have anything to do with the word of God. Matthew 6, 24 said, no man can serve two masters. You can't do it. You either hate the one and love the other or you will hold to the one, despise the other. You can't serve God and, and the spirit of mammon that is in this, this world in which we live. You know, some church organizations call themselves Christians, but what they believe and teach about Jesus is not based on what scriptures say. They've created it. It's a man-made creation. Look, John 14, 6 says, I am the way. Jesus said this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no one, not you, not the person who's trying to convince you or anyone else can come to the Father except through me. Now, you have to start with the fundamental belief that the Bible is truth or none of that makes sense. But he didn't say, I am a way. He said, I am the way. He is not a way. He is the only way. He is not a truth. He is the truth. Jesus is more than a good man or a prophet, which a lot of religions will say, well, we agree. He was a good man. He was a good teacher. He was a good prophet. He is the virgin born, only begotten son of the living God, Jehovah. Not a way. The way. Acts 4.12. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men why, by which we must be saved. The only way. Not another gospel. Not a different Jesus. The scriptures declare that Jesus is God. Christ, the second person of the Trinity. Jesus didn't speak for God. He spoke because he was God and is God today. Jesus said, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. I am God. That's what he said. And the scriptures declare that Jesus died for all men, Acts 17. And he hath made of one blood all nations, all people, of men to dwell on the face of the earth. God wants everyone to go to heaven. I hear that. But I also hear because God wants everyone to go to heaven, we're all going to be saved. Not unless you go through the way and find the truth and have the life. So let's dispel those ideologies and those thought processes. Society has manufactured an altered view of who Christ is and, and what he does. So the question is, which Jesus are you following? Which one are you, are you hooked into? Some teach there's a Jesus that we're saved by grace and there's no commitment or requirement of any kind. 
It's like that convert I was talking about earlier. Say a simple prayer, sign here, you're done, it's good. Whatever you want to do is fine. A lot of churches preach that Jesus today. They've also created a popular Jesus. He says, ah, do whatever you want. Still go to heaven. You get drunk, take drugs, uh, live together, check it out, cheat, steal, live however you choose. No repentance necessary. No commitment necessary. No requirements necessary. Just do whatever you want to do. That's not the word of God I read. This is a false Jesus they're talking about. This is a different Jesus. This Jesus of compromise never insists that you do God's will or be obedient or be faithful. This Jesus that they're talking about will never call you to obedience and repentance. This Jesus is created for man's ideas and traditions. If I were to create something like that, I would want an approving Jesus who approved whatever I did. If I wanted to live in my flesh, live according to the world's standards, I would create a Jesus like that. This is a Jesus that never asked me to pick up my cross and follow. Never. Whatever you want to do is fine. This Jesus allows you to do whatever you please while believing that you still go to heaven. And multitudes today are following that Jesus. Multitudes today are following that philosophy and that doctrine. And they love following that Jesus because you do whatever you want. You remember your children when they were growing up? They didn't want you to put any restrictions on them. They didn't want you to say no. Well, that's the kind of parent you wanted, but thank God that's not the kind of parent you had. Because guess what you'd be today? I, I've said it before, every baby's a terrorist. And they, they want what they want, and they want it now, they want it their way, and they'll blow up the room if they have to, to get their way. Without any... Without any control, we all are filled with sinful desires. Unless we're taught, unless we have some controls placed on us, unless somebody says, no, you can't do that because it will destroy your life. So this Jesus they're following, they want their way. Have their cake and eat it too. Dino likes that. Have their cake and eat it too. <laughs> but John the Baptist's message, you know, the real Jesus says, you must be born again. You got to give up the other to take this. It's like the trapeze artist. You got to let go of that to grab hold of this. And if you never let go of that, you'll never get what I promised you. John the Baptist's message was repent. Repent, he said, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. See, this message of repentance, people look at it as God's judgment. They think, well, that's an ugly God. I don't want to serve a God that makes me quit doing what I want to do. That, that tells me if I don't do what he says, I'm going to hell. Hell is real. Because heaven is real. So I don't want a God like that. I want to serve a God that's nice. I want to serve. Well, guess what? This is this message. This repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And you must be born again. That is a message of mercy. Not judgment. We have to change the way we think about this. It's a message of mercy straight from the heart of God. God's saying, if I leave you alone and let you do what you want to do, you're going into the chasm. You're going to destroy yourself. And I want to prevent that because I love you this much. I love you this much is what Jesus did for us. God's been merciful for a long time. So that people would hear the word and repent and be saved and come to him and know him and love him and allow him to love them. But First Thessalonians tells us that there's going to be a lot of people who've grown hard and gone against the call. First Thessalonians 5 verse 2 says, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. No warning. No preparations can be made unless you make them long term. A lot of people are living life saying, Well, I'll just do as much of this as I can and then I'll just get saved right before the end. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden disruption comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. The day, I look at it this way. The day of the Lord is going to come as it was in the days of Lot. There was no sign of impending judgment in Sodom and Gomorrah. And those cities were fruitful. They had no lack. They had everything they needed. They were, they were filled with the things of the world. Everything was the same as it had been for their fathers. We sometimes get duped into expecting, being entitled, and saying, oh, it'll never change. Everything's going to be just fine. Luke 17, 28 says they ate, talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. 
That sounds like America to me. Sounds like the world today. Read it again. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built, they were happy, and we, we've got everything we need and nothing's going to change. But they were caught totally unaware. They must have thought God was not taking any notice of their lifestyles. They must have thought that abortion, homosexuality, drunkenness, drug addiction, all the things that were going on then that are going on today, uh, God was taking no notice of whatsoever. Hmm. But Lot, a man who knew God, he was right there in the middle of that society and he was also unaware of God's coming judgment. Christians, people who know God, can be sitting in the same place Lot was without the messengers of God coming to specifically tell him of what was about to happen. He didn't know because he had become so enamored with the things that were around him that he plugged into it and he became a part of it. He chose to live there. He chose to participate. He chose to do the things that the, the type of wife he had. He chose a wife uh, from that group. He, the children he fathered by incest. I mean, here he was. We could see it in his attitude concerning what the will of God was. He really didn't care. He was happy to be a part of a affluent world and just roll along thinking nothing's going to change. See, the ways the ungodly are like seeds. Slowly but surely, they begin to bear fruit in you and your family and your grandchildren. And if we don't stop it at some point and become aware and make others aware, then it will destroy us. His standards, Lot's standards were not dictated by God any longer. They were dictated by society. Here's where we get off base. When we don't allow God's standards to be our standards, and we allow society to dictate who we become, we will be destroyed. Second Peter 2, 7 and 8 says, Lot became oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. So Jesus was warning when he said in Luke 17, remember Lot's wife? Why? Because she had been influenced by the world so much that she looked back when told not to because she longed for the things of the flesh. She looked back and God's judgment came upon her immediately. Jesus said, whoever will save his life. It's funny that he said, remember Lot's wife, right before he said this. Whoever seeks to save his life, that means the life of the flesh, will lose it. And whoever loses his life, in another place he said, for my sake, will save it. Remember, John the Baptist's message was repent for the kingdom of God's at hand. That's still the message today. It's still the message for our society. It's still the message in the wilderness of life here in America today, here in Branson, Missouri. And now when John Baptist is talking about that, uh, here he is, uh, these religious men come out, these Pharisees, they come out to, to check him out because people were leaving. Listen, here's what happens. When, when God shows up and when the message is correct with the scripture, with the word, and he was quoting Old Testament here, as Isaiah said, repent. And he was telling them as a prophet of God. Uh, and the people were leaving the Pharisees place and coming over to hear him out in the wilderness. And the Pharisees were disturbed by this. They, they wanted to find out. And, and when John the Baptist looked at him, uh, he, he was such a uh, nice guy and, and politically correct. No. He said, you're a brood of snakes. He saw into their hearts. God showed him what he should know. And he said, you're snakes. He saw right through their masks, right into the motives of their heart. So they asked him, who are you? So that we can give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? In John 1, 22, he said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. I'm preparing for Jesus to come. And today, those of us who will stand up and say, I'm the voice of one crying in a wilderness where this is not heard much. I'm saying, make straight, prepare for the way of the Lord. He's coming again, folks, and he's coming soon. Jesus is coming back, and we need to tell people without reservation and not play games any longer. A prophet points people to Jesus. True. Well, listen, if, if you think God's put you in the ministry of a prophet, 
He'll make it known. You don't have to. You don't have to tell anybody about it. You don't need to advertise your position in ministry. John the Baptist didn't have uh, banners up. He went on TV. Uh, he didn't have a radio program. He, he was a prophet. He, one of the surest ways to know that someone's not a prophet is for them to tell you they are. Because a prophet's not going to go broadcast himself. He won't. He won't do it. So if somebody comes around to you telling you they're a prophet, just know they're not. They're just doing things on their own. Because if God's put you in the ministry of a prophet, you don't need to tell anybody. He'll tell them. He'll prepare their hearts to hear from you. He'll, he'll get them ready to hear what you're saying as a prophet of God. You know, uh, the position of prophet's interesting anyway. A prophet, the way I look at it, and as I study scripture, um, your prophetic calling will be seen in, by the fruit of your life. Always. I mean, it'll be in the way your family uh, manages itself. It'll, it'll be your business. It'll be your, in your ministry. It, your fruit will reveal your call. You won't have to tell anybody. God will prepare their ears. And a true prophet will always point people to Jesus. Always, always, always. A prophet will call for people to repent. Because a prophet knows without true repentance... There is no salvation, no conversion, no true conversion. Repent, therefore, Acts, in, uh, Peter said in Acts 3. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. That's conversion, folks. No other way. So um, Paul describes people in the last days, the days we're living in. He says they'll call on the name of the Lord. They'll attend church. They'll even be excited about the promises of God. And they'll deny uh, the need and the power of godliness to change them because well, I'm doing okay. I'm doing fine. Uh, they'll love learning about, uh, Paul said, as we read earlier, uh, uh, ever learning but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. I know a lot of people who know a lot of scripture. They know how to quote it. They know how to speak it. Uh, they can tell you more than you know. Uh, Carol and I know people like that. I mean, they just, they know, they know a lot of scripture, but it's not applied in their life. And so, God says in Jeremiah 9, 6, through deceit, though they, they, they appear to have a spiritual life, through deceit, they refuse to know me. Uh, their lives are built on deception. They want people to think they're something that they're not. And when we have that, when we haven't thrown ourselves on the floor before God and said, God, I am worthless. I am nothing. I need you. If I don't have you, I have nothing. I'll be nothing. I can do nothing. It's only through the power of the Holy Spirit of God living in me that I can do anything. And until we get to that place, we're filled with deceit and we're walking in our own flesh and in our own spiritual uh, attitudes that are self-righteous. You know what sets up then? Spiritual atrophy. What happens is if you're not on your knees praying, then there's spiritual atrophy that takes place. That's a whole other sermon. I'll get to that some other time. In Matthew 7, Jesus said this in verse 22. Many will say to him in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? You see how this, this deceit is so sneaky that it, it mimics, it masquerades itself and mimics and imitates the very things of God. We've done many wonders in your name. Jesus said, I'll declare to them, hey, I never knew you. You never prostrated yourself on the floor before me in prayer. You never gave yourself to me. You never said, Lord, I want you more than I want anything. You never committed to me. You never repented of your sins, and you never gave yourself over to me. He said, I'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. First Corinthians 6, 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? unrighteous, not self-righteous, unrighteous. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. The important point here is God looks at the heart. God's looking at your heart. The true state of the person not determined by actions is determined by the heart. So, you know, we've tried, uh, we've grown up in Pentecost, and uh, we know what it is. And some of us in holiness movement, early on, uh, we determined a lot of stuff by the way we looked, the way we dressed, what we did and what we didn't do. Uh, but one of the definitions of holiness is the state of being pure. 
but God's looking at the heart. You see, we've tried to attain holiness through rules and regulations. Uh, many churches have restrictions and we've had legalistic rulings and uh, we tried to do all that to obtain purity because we thought if we looked right or if we did this, if we went through the action, we'd be pure and God would approve. Well, God's looking for inward holiness. He's looking for a heart that's pure toward him because he knows that if that happens, you've heard me say uh, about people that we're bringing into the kingdom of God, we catch them, God cleans them. When we go fishing, that's the way it works, folks. We can't tell them, well, don't do this and don't do that and don't do that. And we might let you do that, uh, but we can't have you do that. Listen, if we're going to bring people into the kingdom of God, we got to allow the discipleship of the word of God to cause an inward change of the heart that creates a pure heart that will produce pure conduct. This is the way it works. This is what Jesus was saying. First, he said in Matthew 23, Cleanse the inside of the cup and dish. Talking to prophecy, uh, Pharisees here, was he? Uh, clean the inside of the cup and the dish. Clean the heart that the outside of them may be clean also. Stop trying to do it superficially. Stop trying to be cosmetic about your life with a facade that's really not you. You know, when, you, when you're when you playing games with God, I preached a sermon a while back about the imposter. The imposter who lives in us. If we're not careful, this pretender lives inside us. And when we go to pray, the reason it's hard to pray for an imposter or pretender to pray is because when he kneels down, God doesn't see anybody there because he's praying words that don't come out of a heart because the heart's not pure. The heart is pretending all the time. And the facade that's in the life is the life of the pretender. And God says, well, I don't see anybody. I don't hear anything from that person because he's not praying from his heart. He's praying from a pretense, an imposter. It's only when we come before God in true commitment, repentance, and completely saying, like I said before, God, I, if I don't have you, I don't have anything. If you're not here, I'm not worth anything, Lord. You've got to live in me. You've got to do things in me and through me. Jesus said it. Cleanse the inside. The outside will take care of itself. If you heart's pure, you, you won't desire. In fact, you won't, won't even tolerate sin. Yet, you will not condemn those who have sinful lifestyles. And that's the hard part, isn't it? To be pure in heart, to love God's righteousness, and not condemn those who haven't quite gotten there yet. See, often we categorize sin as Christians. And we allow some sins and we can't allow others. With God, all sin is sin. It doesn't have any kind of priority list. That's why I said I was talking uh, a week or so ago about white lies. There are none. A lie is a lie. Deceit is deceit. Sin is sin. All the things that we read in that list a moment ago. Well, let's read it in Galatians 5, in verse 19. It's interesting, isn't it? You read in Galatians, you find the works of the Spirit, and then you go to the works of the flesh. Galatians 5, 19 says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are... Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies. Now, where have I seen that? Oh, yeah, on TV. Uh-huh. Let's read that again with that in mind. Movies, television, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Hmm. Think that up there for just a minute. I want you to look at it and think about it. What have I been watching? Uh, what uh, video games have I allowed my kids to play? Um, what have I talked about? Uh, what about my anger? Huh. You just go through the list and you realize, wow, this world in which we live, this society in which we're a part of, we have to be so attuned to the things of God or else it, like it did with Lot and his family, it gets inside us and we become such a part of it and it's such a part of us that we don't know the, the difference between flesh and spirit. So what's the basis of your faith? Are you building your life on illusion? On some kind of 
idea that, well, God loves us all and are, are you being scammed by some imagination of men? I mean, some philosophy, some doctrine? Uh, have you examined the facts? Have you looked into the truth? Or have you dismissed the Bible and Christianity as some kind of a uh, thing without evidence? Uh, you know, uh, I believe in creation, but I believe uh, the creation that happened came from a big bang. You know, I, I believe that uh, there is a way to do uh, do this world and, and agree with science and, and still agree with, with the word. Where are you in all that? I extend a challenge to you today. It's a little different from what you'll find in most other philosophies and religions of the world. Most, most religions say, uh, you just have to believe what we're telling you. And I'm going to tell you, don't believe what I'm telling you today. You go to the word of God. You dig it out for yourself. Please don't just believe your pastor. Please just don't believe your evangelist. Please just don't believe the TV guy, uh, the Christian uh, TV guy. You go dig it out for yourself. God wants to speak to you personally. God wants to have a relationship with you through his word. This is his character. This is who he is. This is what he wants you to know. And hearsay in a court of law is not good enough. And neither is it in God's court. You need to know for yourself. You need to have it firsthand. This is something that God wants you to know. He wants to speak to you personally. He wants it to be one-on-one -on -one relationally. And when that happens, you know what you know, and nobody can come along and tell you it's not real. Thank you, Lord. Here's words. Study the life of Jesus. See if it matches the claims. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The man who wrote Evidence That Demands a Verdict, Josh McDowell, friend of ours. He set out as a college student to disprove the resurrection. He's a, he's a brilliant man. But as he dug into it, he found that it was real and he gave his heart to Jesus. He's a great speaker and writer. So you study it out, folks. Find it out for yourself. True Christians are not afraid of of serious and honest study and scrutiny about what they believe. If you really want to know, dig it out for yourself. Which Jesus are you following today? Are you following the Jesus that somebody told you about and you never checked it out for yourself? Have you taken the time? This is eternal, folks. This is something serious. We don't get another chance at this. You're not rehearsing this life. This is the play. You have one performance and it's over. And when it's over, it's done. No rehearsal. This is it. It's time to get serious. Paul wrote, 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then our faith is useless or in vain. Why do we do any of this? You have to come to grips with why this is important. If Jesus is the truth, he'll stand up under any scrutiny. If he's not what he claims to be, then you shouldn't follow him anyway. Chrysler Chairman Lee Iacocca used to have a uh, great advertisement. He said, if you can find a better car, buy it. I said, if you can find a better Savior, grab hold of him, follow him, do what he says do. But I'm telling you, there is no other Savior. Who is he? Messiah, King of kings, Lord of lords. He's Jesus. He's first and last, the beginning and the end. He always was. He always is. He always will be. He was bruised and he brought our healing. <laughs> he was dead and he brought us life. Think about it. Wow. He's my redeemer, my savior, my guide. He's my peace, my help, my comfort, my guide, my Lord. He rules my life. Jesus, Jesus, Lord to me. He's the master and the savior and the prince of peace. Ruler my heart today. He is Lord. He'll never leave me, never forsake me, never forget me. Look, when I, when I fall, he lifts me up. When I fail, he forgives my sin. When I'm weak, he's my strength. When I'm lost, he finds me and loves me and wraps me in his love. When I'm afraid, he's my courage. Glory to God. When I don't know what to do, he tells me because he's my instructor and my guide. Hallelujah. He's holy. He's righteous. He's gentle. He's mighty. He's powerful. He's all in all. He is everything to me. Hmm. Come along too late to tell me it don't work. I've already experienced it all. Thank you, Lord. 
And if this seems, any of this seems impressive to you, then think about this. This Jesus, this only begotten Son of God, this man who walked the shores of Galilee, this man who was God and man, who died on a cross and gave his blood for us, but was resurrected on the third day and is alive forevermore. This Jesus wants a relationship with you. Wow. He wants to know who you are. He wants to talk with you and walk with you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And if you're missing something in the relationship, it's time you spend a little more time with him. Relationship is built with time. That's the only way. I can be acquainted with Jesus if I don't want to spend time with him. But if I want to know him and want him to know me, we'll spend time together. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us. Thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus. I praise you. I thank you. I honor you. I love you. I worship you. And we glorify your name, the name above every name. Thank you, Lord, that you came and walked among us. You came as a baby, but you didn't stay a baby. You're the Savior. You're the resurrected Lord. Because you live, we have hope. We say thank you.